Welcome to Room Now and the latest therapeutic update. Today, we're going to be focused on the August 3rd meeting of the Arthritis Advisory Committee to the FDA. Before the committee was the question of whether or not tofacitinib or Zelgens should be approved for the treatment of psoriatic arthritis. Our guest today is Dr. Jack Cush. He is the executive editor of Room Now. Jack, welcome. Hi, John. Good to be with you. I've got five questions for you. Let's just start off right at the beginning. The committee apparently uh, took a unanimous vote based on two trials. What's your impression of why they took that action and what impact it has? Well, it was a very straightforward meeting. There were no big surprises, and they were charged with looking at the risk-to-benefit ratio of this drug in uh, psoriatic arthritis. They, you know, they presented their pretty much all their data. You know, they've, It's been out there for a long time in rheumatoid arthritis. It's been given to over 22,000 patient years of, of use in patients and trials. Um, but this data was based on 783 patients in two clinical trials, either in TNF-naive or TNF-experienced patients. Uh, and, and, and again, they heard the data. The panel uh, voted 10 to 1 in favor of its approval based on safety and efficacy. Uh, and the data was very straightforward and very impressive. The, um, if you look at a number needed to treat and a number needed to harm as measures of efficacy and safety, the number needed to harm was somewhere around 1 to 300 to 500, either for cancer or um, uh, zoster, whereas the number needed to benefit and get an ACR 50 response, a high-level response, was basically one in every three to eight patients. So uh, there was a sh very, very strong uh, efficacy to uh, uh, toxicity uh, ratio here, which made it an easy, easy vote. So I think that the uh, unanimity of the panel members, the kind of the rapidity and flow of the data, both by the FDA and by the, the company, were very clear that this is something uh, worth considering and should have been approved. Were you surprised at the lopsided vote? Uh, not at all. Not at all. In fact, I was I, I was surprised it wasn't a hundred percent unanimous. There was one uh, person who held out who seemed to have um, been hung up a little bit about uh, some uh, issues that were hard to explain. Uh, and so, but uh, you know, ten to one is a very strong uh, favorable vote. Uh, second question: There was a lot of discussion about the X-ray data. But it appears like this won't be an indication or it won't wind up on the label. What's that mean? Well, again, it was done in one of the trials, uh, not both of the trials. Um, the trials were really not large enough uh, or empowered um, in, in such a manner to uh, allow for an X-ray indication. Uh, what they did, though, was they did X-rays as one of the trials. Uh, and uh, the idea was not necessarily to prove that it afforded patients radiographic benefit, but that, at least was said by the company, that they wanted to show that while patients were getting better, they weren't getting worse radiographically. And that was an important point. So while the data was reviewed extensively both by the sponsor and by the FDA, there was a large, long discussion about what it means, especially when you start doing all kinds of comparisons and how you handle the placebo population that didn't get placebo for full 52 weeks. There was some that they largely got the drug after an opening period of 14 weeks. Uh, and the data was very strong that whether you were on placebo or whether you were on the Zelljans for the whole 52 weeks, that there was very little in the way of x-ray progression. Uh, it was really quite encouraging. Now, the group that the Zelljans or TOFA group was being compared to was a placebo group with different kinds of extrapolations. And even there, it looked pretty good. But the, those people didn't progress very much, as is the case in many trials today, that it's hard to get patients who are going to progress. So uh, the company fulfilled its obligation that if patients didn't get worse radiographically, even though they got better clinically. Uh, again, since it wasn't being specifically sought for as an x ray indication, that certainly is not going to happen in this label if it gets approved. It probably will. Um, but whether it ends up in the label or the description of how the studies were done, what the x-ray findings were, and leave it to the reader and the clinician to make their own conclusions remains to be seen. My guess is it will be in, the, in there somehow. 
but I wouldn't be surprised if it worked. Getting that x-ray approval, is that an important uh, step for eventually for the drug? I think for, for clinical trialists, for uh, the companies that develop these products, x-ray um, protection is an important step. It is uh, another indication, another bit of, uh, of, of evidence why you should be using such therapies. For instance, a very popular therapy right now, Primalas, doesn't have a radiographic benefit because they never did radiographic studies. Uh, and so it, it is important. To clinicians, it's sort of split. Some clinicians believe it's paramount. It's absolutely necessary to prove that you're a strong biologic or a strong disease-modifying drug. Um, myself, I'm not so interested in radiographic outcomes. I know that if a drug has the degree of benefit that this drug has, that there's radiographic benefits that will fall in line behind that. So I think it is important in drug development. I think that they may pursue it in the future, but coming right out of the gate, they won't get an x-ray indication from the FDA. Uh, next up, the, the same safety risks we're seeing in the psoriatic arthritis trials as we're seeing in the RA trials. Is this good news for docs? Well, I think it is. And I think that's important to note because, one, there are no new surprises in the safety profile when given to a different population, in this case, psoriasis. Um, second, they, um, at one time, when the drug was first approved in rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of these safety signals were of some concern to rheumatologists. You know, the liver enzymes, the lipid elevations, the risk of herpes zoster, uh, an unknown cancer risk. Uh, those were things, I think, that held a lot of people back early on when they were using this, uh, when it was first indicated for rheumatoid arthritis. But we're several years down the road. People now understand uh, the safety profile of this drug. I don't think safety is a factor in prescribing this drug. I think that will be the same in psoriatic arthritis, seeing the same data in the psoriatic patients, as we've seen in RA, tends to be something that uh, will has a built-in confidence, if you will, for those who may want to use this drug in psoriatic arthritis. Okay, Jack, question number four. If there is approval for psoriatic arthritis, what does this mean for the treatment of psoriasis? Well, uh, of course, they did look at psoriasis outcomes uh, in this trial, but it's important to note that the drug was studied as well in psoriasis, uh, and that application has been withdrawn. Those trials didn't go quite as well as I think the sponsor would like them to have gone. The doses that worked uh, as far as skin disease were very high doses. Only the 10 milligram BID dose, a dose that's not approved in the United States, really had any kind of sort of competitive, uh, competitive edge against the drugs it was compared to. So this drug is not indicated for and won't be indicated for psoriasis. Uh, they did look at psoriasis outcomes in, this, in these PSA trials, looking at POSI 75, and they, as, as has been seen in other psoriatic trials, fairly modest um, and, but encouraging skin results. Um, I think it means nothing, meaning that this should not be taken as a, approval for psoriatic arthritis should not be uh, a ticket to use this in psoriasis. Again, the data there has been weak. There will be no indication as far as cutaneous psoriasis based on the data presented to the FDA. And the last, but maybe not least question, question number five, there have been a lot of drug approvals for the treatment of psoriatic, psoriatic arthritis. Do we need yet another drug to treat this disorder? Well, you're right. It's getting crowded in the psoriatic space. Um, we have five TNF inhibitors. We have um, abatacept recently approved in the last month. Um, and we have two or three IL-17 inhibitors. And now um, this small molecule may join a primalast, another small molecule therapy, as an indication for psoriatic arthritis. It's very, getting very crowded. I think it is a good thing. I think, number one, uh, these are all different mechanisms that are being attacked and psoriasis like rheumatoid arthritis like lupus is probably not just one disease with one singular biology i think it, to have different mechanisms in play will benefit the most amount of patients number two having more drugs creates more competition which if anything will increase the number of patients who will have access to care uh, so the competition will grow the, the the i guess the use of more aggressive therapies in patients with psoriatic arthritis and you know, for many years, we relied just on hydroxychloroquine and methotrexate, two drugs I really would never use today to manage psoriatic arthritis. 
So I think it is a good thing. It is going to get crowded. Um, and I think that, uh, again, there'll be standouts in the long run. Right now, who is it going to be? I, we do know that TNF inhibitors have been strong, strong agents to manage both the skin and the joints. But we do need drugs to manage the joints, uh, maybe even more so than skin, especially in the rheumatology clinics. So I think another drug uh, in the marketplace will benefit patients and clinicians who have to manage these patients. Were you, were you surprised at any of the action taken by the uh, committee? Not at all. Again, on the three questions that were put before them, they were unanimous including the last question to vote for approval, it was not you know, not completely unanimous. It was 10 to 1 with the same loan uh, holdout. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, again, these deliberations are advisory to the FDA who will come back with a decision probably within, my guess is within about six weeks' time. It could be two months' time. Uh, but I think there'll be a fairly rapid decision about this hearing and, and the others. I think what was important at these particular FDA advisory panels that occurred on the 2nd and 3rd of August were a number of issues that were very important to the FDA on how to consider clinical trial design and data interpretation. And, and, and as we discussed in the other therapeutic update, the issue of, of placebo-treated patients, is that ethical or not, when to allow for early uh, exits, and what how to handle the patients in an early exit strategy. And in this particular study, how to handle x-ray data, especially when there's limited exposure, to placebo populations. These trials were very important to the FDA in, um, in how they're going to manage trials in the future. Would you be shocked if the advisory committee's recommendations weren't followed? Uh, yes, very much so. Hence, um, uh, I think you'll, you'll, you'll hear many jaws drop if that were to happen, but that's not going to happen. All right. Dr. Kush, thank you very much. That's the latest from Room Now and our coverage of the August 3 Arthritis Advisory Committee. We'll talk to you later. Take care. Bye, John.